Welcome to What's New in Firebase for Building Generative AI Features. Uh, I'm Frank, but honestly, most people call me Puff. And uh, I work at Firebase, and I do a monthly show called Firebase Release Notes, where we cover every month the updates from Firebase in, say, three, four minutes, something like that. Now, today, we have over 40 minutes, it says here on the countdown timer. So we have lots more updates to get through, and that's amazing. In fact, let's use a clicker and see what we're going to cover today. First up. We changed our brand. We've got a brand new logo. Can you imagine that? <laughs> this is because we're doing more and more generative AI. And we want to sh wanted to show you about that Firebase transformation, which is also where I'm wearing. Oh, no, man. I forgot to put on my right shirt. It's not good. Um, hold on. I saw teammates in the front row. Marina, Rich, can you help out for a bit while I go backstage and change shirts? <laughs> Hey, Puff. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Marina. And I'm actually not being very helpful now because um, it's Rich Star and I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have some updates later. I'll see you later. Hey, and I'm Rich, also on the Firebase team. That's the wrong button. There we go. Firebase is Google's app development platform. It empowers millions of developers from startups to top apps to scale apps and experiences across many platforms. Today. We want to share with you how we're evolving Firebase. We're going to harness the power of Gen AI in helping you build modern apps with speed, quality, and safety in Firebase, also making AI accessible to everyone. So this is a generative AI session, so we're going to get stuck right in. Gen AI is exploding in popularity. Why is that? Well, because unlike uh, traditional ML models that are single purpose and kind of focused, Generative AI is flexible, and it's that flexibility that opens up worlds of possibilities. For example, imagine you're building a travel application. Seems to be a popular choice of demo at the moment. Uh, generative AI can change the game. By iterating on a prompt like suggest unique and affordable destinations, you can start to make more engaging experiences for your users. But we all know it's not quite that easy, right? You don't just put a prompt in and put that in your app and um, have a great engaging experience for your users. So the generativeness is where the adaptability is where the magic lies. Gen AI empowers us all to innovate at lightning speeds. And um, we have some new ways to interact with the Gemini models for you today. Vertex. Vertex AI is Google Cloud's enterprise generative AI platform. It has global availability. You retain full control and ownership over your own data. We don't use it for training and, uh, or product improvements. But why am I talking about Vertex? Because we're introducing Vertex AI for Firebase. Yeah! <laughs> we have it in your favorite languages. We have it in Dart, Swift, Kotlin, and JavaScript, enabling you to harness the capabilities of Gen AI from the Vertex AI inside your mobile and web applications. Firebase has consistently delivered the best of Google to mobile and web app developers, and this is absolutely no exception. We have uh, app-focused SDKs and tools. And uh, last month, we brought this out at Cloud Next in private preview, and now it's in public preview. So you can all go straight to the Firebase console and try Vertex AI in Firebase. Not only that, we integrated it with AppCheck. AppCheck's our solution for safeguarding your backend infrastructure. It protects you against billing fraud, phishing, and app impersonation. Uh, app check attests that the traffic coming from your application is legitimate, that it's your application on a legitimate device, and everything else gets blocked. So by using the Firebase SDKs with app check, you get secure Vertex AI direct from your mobile and web apps from the first time. Using the SDKs feels as familiar as always. Super easy. You just go to the Firebase console and hit Get Started. It's going to walk you through. It's going to enable the required APIs, sort out billing, and connect your app to Firebase. Then you're about three to five lines of code away from having Vertex AI in your mobile app, depending on which one of the languages you're using. And as I said, you can start using this today. Start using Vertex AI in Firebase today. And uh, it's public preview now, and we're going to have it in GA around the fall. So by the time you're about to go ready to production, we'll be there with you, ready to go out. There was one thing I did want to cover quickly. You probably saw it in the keynote yesterday, 
but there was a new product that Google launched called Chex. And it's not strictly Firebase, but it's super closely related and very important for the mobile audience. So I'm just going to give you one quick minute on Chex. After extensive user testing, all these companies are already using Chex. The Chex team, they've listened, refined, and built Chex into a powerful platform, and it's launching today to the global developer audience. Hmm. Chex analyzes your apps thoroughly, because as app developers, you want to focus on building great app experiences. You don't want to focus on privacy and security compliance. And uh, Chex will check what your app is required to do, check what your app is actually doing, and what your app says it's doing. And then it's going to put the results of all that on a monitoring and compliance dashboard for you, so you can quickly check off your privacy checklist. It only takes about five minutes to get started, and you end up with a great dashboard like this. In the compliance section, it's going to highlight any potential privacy issues. And then in the data monitoring section, you can see down there, it's going to tell you which endpoints your app is actually sharing data to, which SDKs were found in your application, and the exact data and data types that's being shared off your device. So imagine having that power and that capability when you're trying to launch an application, knowing that you're going to get streamlined through app stores. They're going to, you know, you're sure that your privacy and compliance is up to date with every release that you have. OK, I'm going to head back down with direction and magnitude. It must be time for vectors and puff. You can click on my slide. <clears throat> OK. Um, I love checks, but I must admit, I love the Vertex AI SDKs even more. Because there's no easier way to get started with Gemini API in your application code than that, and you're fully secure. One thing I've learned, though, in the past like year and a half, something like that, is that you get better results out of an LLM if you actually put more information in it, right? You type these long prompts, and you just get better results from that. But who has time to add these long prompts, right? There's by now a standardized approach for adding more information to a question that the user asks, and it's called Retrieval Augmented Generation, or RAG. Let's have a look at how that works. So say that you have a lot of information about one specific domain, like your product documentation. To implement RAG, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cut it into smaller pieces, say one file for each topic of your documentation. Now, for each topic, we're going to generate a vector embedding. Difficult word, but it's actually not that hard. You download a machine learning model from the internet, and you pass in the topic text. You get out a vector representation of that topic, of that text, in such a way that if two topics are closely related, the vectors are also close to each other. Now, really difficult to create, but the good news is that these embedding models create for a lot of, are created for a lot of things already. So we don't have to create them ourselves. We just use them. Okay. So we have topic files, and we have the vector embedding for each of these topics. Now, when the user asks a question, we find the topics that are closely related to that question. So we run the question through the same uh, embedding model, and we compare the vectors. Then we pass those topics and the question to the LLM, and guess what? We get a better answer. That's RAG. So you've heard this a lot. This is all that you need to do. Leaves a few things, right? I talked about how we download these machine learning models, and, and they generate these vector values for you. But how do you actually find near vector values? Well, let's have a look at how that works. So here's a like bit of data about foods. And for each food that we have here, we track its sweetness, its crunchiness, and its spiciness. Okay. So let's say that I like the sweetness of an apple. Well, it's very easy, right? If we look here, I'll probably also like the sweetness of a banana and of ice cream, which is actually pretty accurate. But what if all that I told you is that I like apples? Nothing specific. I just like apples. Well, now suddenly the banana and the ice cream don't look great anymore because they have none of the crunchiness of my apple. Actually, if we go through all of these and compare all the values, a carrot might certainly be a lot better than the other foods. Right? That might be the closest match. Well, congratulations. You've just done a similarity search on vector values, or you found the nearest neighbors. That's the two words we use for this. This is how RAG works. Here we see only three columns. And when you get these vector embeddings from the models, they typically have hundreds or thousands of these values. So and vector embeddings turn a domain-specific problem of comparing something like pieces of text into a mathematical problem of finding nearby vectors. And guess what? Computers are really good at math problems. So. OK, brings us back to Firestore, because that's what we started with. You can now store vector values in your Firestore documents, and you can search for nearby vector values in your Firestore queries. 
So none, nothing. Okay. Um, so you can, um, that means that you can store your topics in your Firestore documents. And then for each of the topics, you calculate the embedding factor, you store it in that document too. Then when the user types a query, you calculate, it, calculate the embedding factor for that. You search the nearby documents, and then you either display those to the user, or you pass them to an LLM, and you've implemented RAG again. That's just one of the features that we added. Oh, I forgot about this slide. <laughs> this is actually how you write a vector value in Node.js. You can also do this in Python. As I said, this is only three values. Uh, in these embedding models, you get like hundreds of these or thousands. That's just one of the features that we added to Firestore. Honestly, we've been adding features to Firestore at a rapid pace in the past year and a half. And I want to go through some of the highlights. This is definitely not all, but some of my personal highlights. First up, you can now have aggregation. So you can count documents or get the sum or average of fields in there without having to read every individual document. You can have OR conditions in queries, and you can have range conditions on multiple fields in a single query. This allows for much more complex queries on Firestore. You can also now have multiple databases in your project. So that means that uh, you can put the Firestore database close to your users. In fact, Firestore is now available in every Google Cloud region. We have point-in-time recovery, which, if you enable it, allows you to protect yourself against coding mistakes and user errors. And you can now schedule backups to happen daily or weekly to cold storage. All just some of the uh, additions that we've made to Firestore recently. And Firestore is our NoSQL database. Uh, in fact, we sort of have a thing for NoSQL databases. It's where we got our start 12 years ago, when we were just this logo. We created a NoSQL database. And we allowed you to access it directly from your mobile and web applications. It dramatically changed how developers build apps. But uh, what if you come from a background in relational databases, and you also want to build cool apps? You also want to use generative AI in them. Well, good news. One of the most popular SQL databases is PostgreSQL. And it has a PG vector package that allows you to store vector values and find nearest neighbors, just like we just did for Firestore. And it's available in Cloud SQL. So we're in business, right? <clears throat> Just leave one problem. Why am I talking about that on a Firebase stage? Oh, we want to give you a sneak peek of something we've been working on for quite some time now, and it's called Firebase Data Connect. With Firebase Data Connect, you can connect directly from your mobile and web applications to the data in a Postgres database that's hosted in Cloud SQL. <laughs> that's right. Firebase now has SQL. We build Data Connect from the ground up to simplify app development. We do it around a single principle that we call a query-defined infrastructure. It basically means that you write the queries, and we'll do the rest. Uh, let's have a look at how this works. So let's say that we want to help our friend David East kickstart his pizza business. So here's one of the screens he needs in his app. You can see that we have pizza orders. So you're probably already thinking about the data model here, right? We're going to have a TBL orders. Then each order has a customer, so we'll have TBL customers. Then we probably need TBL ingredients. With Data Connect, everything starts with the declarative data model. Here's the data model for our users table. Now, this might not be what you expected from a SQL database, because there's no create table statement. That's because we based our model on GraphQL. And these are the properties that then translate into columns in our SQL database. We can query the database like this. So you can see that we have a get users query that queries the users table, and then it returns the ID, the first name, and the last name for every user. Now, that ID property that I'm returning there, I didn't define it in my data model. So when you don't define your own primary key, Data Connect will define one for you. And it's one of those many things that speeds up app development. Also see that we return the first name and the last name, but we're not returning the email address in the country. So you get a subset of the fields. And that's something that you could never do with our NoSQL databases. We also have extensive tooling for Visual Studio Code and available in IDX that speeds up development. For example, there's a code lens that allows you to execute a query right within VS Code, either against the local emulator or against your production database. OK. Based on this information, Data Connect does three things. First, it generates the database in Postgres. Next, it creates an API server that it runs on Google's infrastructure that, connect, that regulates the data access to the database. And third, it generates type-safe SDKs that you can access in your apps for Android, web, and iOS. Let's have a look at how this works in practice. 
So here's some Kotlin code in my Android app. You can see in the first few lines that I import the SDK and that, that I import my list users query. That's the same query that we just defined. Then we execute that query. We get all the users from it. We take the first user and we get their first name. Note that a lot of this comes straight from the previous slide, right? It comes from our schema and from the query that we defined earlier. Nothing here is a string. Everything is type safe Kotlin code generated by Data Connect. There's one thing that's been bugging me about this data model, though. I keep saying first name, but I actually called the property first. So let's go back into our schema and change that. So we change first to first name and last to last name. Now, Data Connect behind the scenes performs a database migration on Postgres so that column, name, column names match with my data model here. It also updates a new API server and it generates a new SDK. So if we import that SDK into Android Studio, it can show us that this first property no longer exists, that we need to use first name now. Note that at no point did I have to look for like, the column name in a SQL string anywhere. Right? I'm not been going through hand-coded DTO objects looking for an annotation. All I did was change the schema, and everything flowed from there. That's the power of Data Connect and query-defined infrastructure. You probably want to build some richer queries than with the one we just saw, right? And um, let's say that we want to add a join. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add an action table. We're going to call the table orders because it stores, well, it stores orders. So we have a few properties for every order. And then we have a customer, which is the customer that placed that order. And you can see that that's a type user. Based on this, Data Connect updates the Postgres database so that it has a second table. And there's a foreign key relationship between the two tables so that referential integrity is enforced right away. But it also now knows that every user can have zero or more orders. So we also generate a reverse property on the user called orders on customer that you can use in your queries without having to hand code or your uh, or your joins. Let's see what happens if we want to access orders and see how authorization works. So here you have a get orders uh, query, which reads straight from the orders table. And that first line, you see auth.uid not equals null. If you've ever done anything with Firebase, you know what that means. Because this means that only a user that signed into Firebase authentication can execute this query. That's all you need to do. It's now secure. So the thing, though, we don't want to just return all orders, right? We want to return just the orders for this user. So in that second line, we add a condition to the query saying, hey, only return the orders where the customer's user ID matches the uh, ID of the signed-in user. And uh, keep in mind, this runs on Google's API server. So there's no way for a malicious user to bypass this. They can only get access to the data that you give them access to. We return the total amount for each order, and we join in some properties for the customer here. And of course, we then generate a Kotlin code where we can execute this again. Remember, everything here is auto-generated and type safely accessible in your Kotlin app. This is just a one-to-many uh, relationship. Of course, Data Connect can also do many-to-many -many relationships and many more complex conditions than many more complex conditions than this. We're excited about seeing what you will build with um, this query-defined infrastructure. But let's have a look, because we are here for Gen AI. Remember, I already said that uh, Postgres supports PG, PG vector, which allows you to store vector values and search for similar vector values. So here's how you update data with Data Connect. It's called a mutation. And here we are updating the pizza, where we take a reference to that pizza, its ID, and we take a description that you, that you can enter. Now, we do an insert to the database, or actually we do an absurd in the database. And we then run embedding embed, which is a special operation that calculates an embedding vector, a vector embedding, excuse me. Um, you can see that we run the model called Gecko, version 3, apparently. We write the vector embedding and the original description to the database. Now, it's pretty much the same that I had to do earlier for Firestore, except that there I had to write the backend code myself. With Data Connect, it's all built in. Let's have a look at how we can actually search on these values. So here's a query to search pizzas. You get a query, which is what your user entered. And they can specify one ingredient that they really think must be in every pizza that they ever see. So we run something, and it's called description, description embedding similarity. Description is the field name, field name we had earlier. We calculated the embedding, and now we're searching for similarity. We take the query that the user entered, and we pass it through that same model that we used earlier, the Gecko model. 
Then we add an additional condition where we say, hey, only return pizzas where what the user specified as their favorite ingredient is included in the list of ingredients. And give me the five nearest results, the five closest results to the description that they entered. We load those results and we either display them again to the user or we pass them into an LLM and we get reg again. With Data Connect, we reimagined app development from the ground up. With our query defined infrastructure, you can get started quickly and you can focus on building application logic. Behind the scenes, Data Connect takes care of keeping your database, your API server, and your client side data access code in sync. We think this will dramatically speed up the way you develop apps. Data Connect is not ready for production yet, but we're excited to give you a sneak peek here today. I invite you all to join the gated preview where we're rolling out invites in the coming weeks or months. Now, Rich, did you have more Gen AI for us? Thank you, Paul. All right, Firebase Data Connect, now reimagining the way that you can connect your back end from your front end in a mobile app is very exciting. And it's SQL in Firebase, which is very exciting. But I'm just as excited by Firebase GenKit. Hopefully you saw this in the keynote yesterday. We're all getting used to writing prompts and iterating with prompts. But what if you have a more advanced generative AI workflow? Firebase GenKit is an open source integration framework to help make building sophisticated AI flows simple and easy and familiar, like Firebase you'd expect. So with GenKit, you can create AI-powered apps that can do things like answer questions based on your data, make decisions and take action, turn unstructured data into insights, and personalize your experiences for every single user. It supports you all the way from prototype to production. That's one of the most exciting things about it, is its, uh, it's UIs. I'll show you in a sec. You can build uh, faster. We have AI libraries integrated already. We've got um, AI models, vector stores, evaluators, tools, and features to help you debug your Gen AI workflows. And then you can deploy it. You can scale with uh, cloud functions for Firebase and Cloud Run. We have integrations with cloud monitoring, cloud logging, Firebase authentication, app check, as mentioned before, and Firestore. It's server-side development at the moment in TypeScript, and Go is also coming soon. It's in, in development. So a key area where GenKit can help you speed up is in your uh, prompt development. Prompt engineering is more than just tweaking text. The model you use, the parameters that you supply, the format you request, they all going impact, to uh, impact your output quality. Jenkit.prompt file format uh, interesting. lets you put it all into a single file like this for easier testing and organization. And the content format supports other types of data as well. It supports multimedia. So you can use like Gemini 1.5 Pro. You can use multimedia in and multimedia outputs. Not only that, with Jenkit, it allows the AI models to fetch data, display UI, write to databases, or execute other functions. Anything that you can code, you can get the AI to interact with. So in GenKit, when we're composing this, we bring all these components together in a flow. Flows are special functions. They're strongly typed, streamable, locally and remotely, remotely callable. And most importantly, they're fully observable. GenKit provides a CLI and developer tooling so that you can work your way through your workflows and trace them. You can even view production traces, and it will render the images for you. So let's have a look at one. This is the, the GenKit UI, developer UI. And in this one here, I'm going to build a flow that takes in a restaurant, uh, restaurant menu image, extracts the data from it, and does some Gen AI on it. Our little prompt question on the menu is going to be, what's good for a chicken item? And this is the, the output of that prompt. But what has our flow done? You can see on the left-hand side, we have the full trace of our flow. You can see, first of all, the first part of it was to extract the text from the restaurant menu. So we have this little prompt to extract all the text from the menu with the menu image. And you can see the result of that. That's the first component in the flow. Brings out all the text from the menu image. The second part of the flow, we ask the AI to act as Walt, the helpful AI assistant of the restaurant. 
And you can see here that the exact correct text from the first part of the flow where you extracted the menu is also inside here. So you can see that your code that you put together in your flow is, uh, is working in the process, fully debuggable as you expect it. And then you get the response from Walt telling you what your, your favorite chicken item is going to be. So wait. I'm super excited with this one. I've been playing with so many different flows over the last couple of weeks and just executing them and watching them come out and see all the debuggable. And then you can just upload it to Cloud Run. And you, know, you have absolutely safe, secure Gen AI working on, a, on the cloud. <laughs> so I got too excited. That bit wasn't even in the script. We just went over a lot of information. What if we had a way? for you to find it when you actually needed it at just the right time. Marina, can you help us out? I can, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. <laughs> right, so Puff and Rich just covered a lot of launches. And with so many new products and features, it's only natural that we're going to have some questions. So for moments like this, you can count on AI assistance in Firebase. Gemini and Firebase just became generally available, and we have extended the promotional period until July 30. So this is the perfect opportunity for you to try this out. Gemini and Firebase was trained in the Firebase documentation and other relevant content to help answer your questions about Firebase products and features, provide code snippets to help you easily integrate Firebase products into your apps, and offer troubleshooting support. So in other words, it eases the learning curve for you to start building, releasing, monitoring, and scaling your apps with Firebase. Thank you. We also just released Gemini and Crashlytics to help you understand and fix the errors that you encounter in your app by providing you with crash summaries, um, debugging tips, and much more. But I'm going to take more time to talk about Gemini and Crashlytics a little bit later in this presentation. Right now, what I want to do is chat with Gemini and Firebase. So let's say I'm working on this feature for this app. And while I'm coding, I stumble into this uh, Firestore query in the code base. And I don't really understand what it's doing. And to be honest, the code base is not very well documented. We've all been there. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Gemini to help me. All I have to do is open my Firebase project and click on that Try Now button, which opens the Gemini pane. And then I can type, what does this Firestore query do? And paste the query that I just copied from my code base and hit Enter. I'm a slow typer, so it's going to take a while. OK, now Gemini is um, taking some seconds to give me the answer. And here it is. Um, I'm going to sum this up for you. Um, this query was retrieving all the documents in the cities collection um, based on the fields um, where the country field is equal to USA, and then it was being ordered uh, based on the population field in ascending order. And then it's also given me the breakdown line by line, which is helpful to understand the structure of Firestore queries in general. It's also telling me how I can build on top of this query by adding multiple filters, changing the order. It's giving me uh, resources, some related content. And right at the bottom, there is the see in docs button that takes me to the Firebase documentation. Very helpful. Um, so let's say I finished working on this feature. And me and my teammates, we are very excited to launch this feature to the world. But we don't want to risk breaking the existing user experience. So now we are wondering, is there any new Firebase products or feature that can help us gradually and securely release this feature that I just worked on to the world? But instead of asking that to the assistant, I'm going to ask Rich, do you know of any Firebase releases that can help me with that? Let's have a look. Woo, back up. Thank you. I'm just trying to get my steps in today. OK, feature rollout. As developers, we want to ship the latest features and Gen AI features rapidly. But at the same time, you don't want to break the existing user experience. Hopefully, you've already heard of remote config, Firebase remote config. It's our wonderful tool for controlling the behavior and appearance of your application. First of all, you can create in-app defaults for all of your configuration parameters. And then you can override them later on in the Firebase console or with the remote config API, either for all your users or very specific segments of your users. And then we built A-B testing on top of that. 
so that you can experiment with those variants and configuration parameters and figure out which is best. Now, we've also added feature rollouts. You hit the overflow menu on a configuration parameter and choose rollout. Then you can start choosing your target conditions, the value, the percentage, and gradually start rolling out your new feature. So you don't just have to go on or off. You now have a nice um, distribution or segment of the user base that you can roll your feature out to. As it's built alongside Crashlytics, you can check on key parameters as well. Uh, you can see if your app is stable. You can see if there's been any change in crash rate compared to the control, which is just the original users that don't have the new feature. And looking at it, you think, this is a good sign for our launch. We should go ahead. And then you also get to see your engagement time. The engagement time in your application for the new user group has gone up. Another great sign that you should start rolling it out. So seeing the changes stable for hundreds of users, you've uh, increased your confidence enough to roll it out a little bit wider. So you go and update it to 25%. This is one slide ahead. But then what if something goes wrong? Well, hold on a second. You've rolled it out a bit too far, and your servers can't deal with the extra load. With feature rollouts, you can also roll it back again. You can go back from 25% to 5%. You can give the feature back to your original 5% of users. You can keep collecting data from them whilst you figure out what went wrong with your system. And then you can gradually roll it out when you realize you, know, you, you figured out your bugs, you've got the capacity to support all the users. You can increase it back up again and go for, go for full production. And of course, this works with Gen AI just as well. You can have multiple variants of prompts. You can A-B test them. You can roll them out. You can see the engagement. And you can even switch Gen AI models on the fly from your configs. Speaking of releases, what if you had an entire new app to release and not just a few config parameters? Marina? <laughs> thank you. I changed it to you this time. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, releasing a new version of an app is very exciting, especially when it contains Gen AI features. But as we all know, with great features comes great responsibility. And releasing an app version, um, and sorry, monitoring an app version right after it's released to production is very important. Because it doesn't matter how many times we test this app version, the truth is we are all humans, and sometimes we're going to make mistakes. So, Monitoring your app version helps you identify and fix these mistakes before they can cause any frustration to your users and damage your app's reputation, which I'm guessing is something that we all here want to avoid. But it's not only issues that you need to keep track of. You need to keep track of version uptake, um, crash recessions, comparison and benchmark based on previous um, releases of your app, and much more. And today, you must monitor all these different signals across different dashboards, which can be very time consuming. With that in mind, we worked on the release monitoring experience, a place where you can watch all the most important data about your app all in one place in real time. This is how this dashboard looks like, and it's powered by Firebase Crashlytics. It gives you a high level view of the most important release metrics. So let's understand what each piece of this dashboard means. Right at the top, you can see the app version and Crashlytics assessment of that version. This is, was a very simple app that I was working on. So here, the only thing that we can see is that 100% of my active users are already on this version. Right below, you can see two charts. The first one shows you the app starts. And you can see that you can compare this uh, latest version with up to two previous versions which gives you the context that you need to understand your app's historical stability. And right here, um, you can see the percentage of sessions and users that have experienced your app without any crashes. And I want to highlight this is very important because a crash during someone's first uh, interaction with your app can cause them to abandon your app, which again is another thing that we all want to avoid. And Right here, you have a list of the new and regressed issues. And if you click on any of them, it takes you to the issues page where you can check more details. Um, but spotting these issues is just the first step. Now you need to face a different challenge. You need to understand the issue, and you need to fix them. According to a recent Stack Overflow survey, 56% of developers spend from 30 minutes to two hours a day trying to find solutions to problems that they encounter in the apps. 
7.2% spend more than two hours a day. These are big numbers. And Crashlytics now has some new features that can help you decrease that time by a lot. Crashlytics now taps into the power of Gemini to help you in the process of prioritizing, understanding, looking for solutions, and finally, fixing your app issues. I prepared a demo before coming to stage today. So let's see this in action. This is the app that I was um, working on. It's a very simple app. You create an account, and you can start taking notes on it. I'm a very creative person. I call this app the Notes app, and I just released a new version of the Notes app. And as I open the Crashlytics dashboard, I can see a lot of issues there that I've never seen before. Let's have a look at them. Here they are. And the first one seems very critical. It has happened 55 times already. So I can click on it to get more inside. Right here, you can see the Data Insights feature, uh, which is a feature that shows you the metadata that is the same across all events. This metadata can be app versions, devices, process dates, and any custom keys you have added to your app. In this case, it's telling me all 55 events of this crash happened in a Google device um, on the latest version of my app. And right above the Data Insights feature, you can see this card that says, I can help you analyze the stack trace and other metrics for this event and suggest solutions to fix it. Sounds awesome. Why not? So I'm going to try the Generate AI Insights button. As this feature uses Gen AI, it takes a little while to analyze the stack trace and give me the recommended next steps. But here they are. Taking a closer look, it seems like this crash happens whenever a thread tries to access my database when it's locked. And if I scroll down, I can see that Gemini and Crashlytics is telling me um, tips to debug this issue, some actionable next steps, um, and it's also telling me best practices to avoid such issues from happening again. For example, I can start using synchronized methods to access my database. Cool. Oh, sorry. Um, and if you're an Android developer, I have even more good news for you. You can generate similar insights directly in Android Studio via the App Quality Insights window. That removes the need to jump back and forth across your browser and your IDE, which saves you a lot of time and helps improve your productivity. Puff, do you want to help me cover the client SDKs updates? You know that. <laughs> In addition to all these changes to the products, we also constantly change our client-side SDKs. And I want to go through some of the highlights there. Again, this is not everything. Uh, on the Flutter side of things, we now support developing Windows apps that use Firestore, Cloud Storage, and Firebase authentication. We've made our SDKs compatible with JS Interop, which means that you can use them to target WASM uh, platforms, which my friends tell me leads to much faster Flutter web apps. And what Rich talked about earlier, I'm very excited to be using the Vertex AI SDKs right in my Flutter app. Um, if you target iOS or other Apple platforms, we've made some changes too. For example, you can now use the Swift APIs without having to install extra packages. Swift is now our default language. We now support watchOS and visionOS thanks to uh, community contributions, and thank you everyone who helped with that. Speaking of Vision OS, you can now upload your symbol files through Crashlytics and then get deobfuscated uh, stack traces for crashes that happen on your app on Vision OS. And we've changed the Firestore build to deliver binaries so that the builds are much faster. Then, let's see, what did we do on Android? Excuse me, yeah. that's, that's oh, my that's yours. Go yeah, for it, go for thank it. Thank you. I know it's too excited to cover this one, so. So Kotlin is now the primary language for our Android SDKs, so you no longer need to import KTX-specific artifacts in your build Gradle file. You can run automated tests with app distribution using the automated tester feature. And speaking of running your apps, you can run them um, in virtual and physical devices using device streaming in Android Studio. That's powered by Firebase. And remember the Crashlytics and Gemini integration we just saw? That can also help you analyze application not responding errors, uh, known as ANRs. And they are known for being very tricky to understand. So we are hoping this will be of huge help for all Android developers. Yeah.
that leaves just one platform, the web. As I was recently going through the SDK updates, I noticed that there's now something called a Firebase server app. And I had to look into that a bit. And it turns out that we're taking our first steps into making it easier to, rent, to use SSR frameworks like Next.js on Firebase. And speaking of Next.js, it's now easier than ever to host Next.js and Angular apps on Google Cloud with Firebase app hosting. If you have a Next.js or Angular app, Firebase app hosting automatically sets up all the infrastructure for you by looking at what your code actually uses. So you just go to the Firebase console, configure what you need, and then you can deploy through GitHub. And best, it's all on Google Cloud's terms of service. Firebase app hosting is the final product that I wanted to tell you about today. It's the next generation of Firebase hosting for web apps. Rich, you want to wrap us up? We covered a lot. Let's wrap it up. Yeah. Thanks, Carl. Yeah, whatever. OK. Firebase is hot right now. Oh, jeez. This room is hot right now. So let's refresh your memories on what we've just covered. We covered a lot of new releases. If you want to check these releases in more detail, you can head to our blog at firebase.blog or our YouTube channel where we've just released a lot of videos. More coming tomorrow. If you want to try out the new products and features, right now you can integrate Vertex AI for simple and powerful Gen AI in your apps. You can start testing SQL in Firebase with Data Connect, now in preview. Yes! You can power, <laughs> you can power your production Gen AI experiences with GenKit. You can roll out your <laughs> through checks to search for privacy, security, compliance issues. You can roll out your new apps, entire new apps, safely with the release monitoring experience. And you can roll out updates incrementally and safely with feature rollouts. Thank you so much for coming to the talk today. 